Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We've been in our Rut to Revival series. Pastor Jody did a great job leading the way and I'm up to bat. And that's hard. It's hard for me not to start a series because uh, I always have a lot of things I want to say but I've surrendered it to God, I'm trying to apply that song already that we just sang. I, 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 I was in a hitting slump. I played baseball for a little bit, um, speaking, speaking of being up to bat. I played baseball for Canada Little League, and I wasn't a great fielder. Like, I was at third base, but I feel bad for the first baseman. He was constantly stretching for balls and missing. You know, I, I, he was missing them. It wasn't me. It was him. That's what it was. He wasn't tall enough. That was the problem. No. It was totally me, but I could hit. And the coaches saw that, and so they put me in cleanup, which is the fourth batter. And something happened, like after a few games, where the pressure just got to me, and I just could not hit a ball for like three games. And it just drove me nuts. I mean, it, it could be, the ball could be the size of a watermelon. I found a way to miss it. <laughs> Speaking of ruts, it was just a hitting slump. It was so bad. And... It was, we were down nine to five at this game. We're about halfway through the season and I just, I really needed to snap out of this, this, this rut and this slump I was in. And all I, all I think I could think of is going back to the default, back to the basics of what, the fundamentals of baseball, you know what I mean? And everyone knows now the nine o'clock, they, they got 100% on this. Everyone knows that when the ball's coming, the batter must do what? All right, it gets you about an 80. You got an 80 on that. <laughs> Keep your eye on the ball. And so, you know, I'm up to bat, and we're down, and I'm like, I'm in fifth position now. I asked them to take me out of fourth and put me in fifth, so all the pressure's on the other guy. <laughs> and we had, a, we had a really rough team. It just was not a good team. Um, and we're down. I can't, I can't even believe we had five runs. And the bases are loaded. So I'm like, more pressure. But then I was like, all right, Ryan, I know what it is. I'm like pep talking myself. I think I hear my dad in the back going, you got this, you know, just relax, relax. And I'm like, I need to keep my eye on the ball. I think I've been taking my eye off of it. And so I, I'm up there, I'm feeling okay, you know. And I see that ball, and it wasn't a watermelon. It was definitely a baseball. And man, I, I hit that thing so hard, bases loaded, I got a grand slam that day. <laughs> Snapped me right out of that rut, right out of that slump. Nine to nine, and they came back and won. So it was, <laughs> it was 11 to nine, and we lost. But man, I felt good. And uh, I believe Dallas Holland, or, or my Uncle Carl, even went and got the ball for me. And uh, we rode on it and everything, and then my dog chewed it up, it's at my house. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to get back to the fundamentals to get out of your ruts, though. And Deuteronomy chapter 1 is our, is our main text today, and we're, we're going to look at this, continue the story of the Israelites in Egypt, and, and uh, they're out of Egypt now, and this journey with God. And Deuteronomy is actually a review of all the things the Israelites went through, and basically what Moses does is he basically goes through and reviews all the things that God gave them as ways of worshiping, commandments, events that took place. He's reviewing with them. Why? So that they don't wander around for 40 years again. And I think that's a good idea. Get back to what God said. So verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> These are the words that Moses spoke to all the people of Israel while they were in the wilderness east of the Jordan River. And I realize that uh, this might be a little different version, just so you know. They were camped in the Jordan Valley near Suf, between Paran on one side and Tophel, Laban, Hazareth, and Dezahabeb. I need a degree for that one. On the other. Normally, it takes only 11 days to travel from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea which is the promised land, going by way of Mount Seir. So only 11 days. 
But 40 years after the Israelites left Egypt on the first day of the 11th month, Moses addressed the people of Israel, telling them everything the Lord had commanded him to say. This took place after he had defeated King Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and, and Adrea had defeated King Og of Bashan, who ruled in Ashtoreth. While the Israelites were in the land of Moab, east of the Jordan, and on the west side would be where the promised land, they need to get through the Jordan River here, Moses carefully explained the Lord's instructions as follows. Okay? So, in real time, it's been 40 years. Okay? The next portion of scripture, what he does is he says, this is what God told us when we were at Mount, at Mount Sinai. And he's basically saying, let's not repeat the same mistake. Okay? And this is what he says in verse 6. When we were at Mount Sinai, the Lord our God said to us, you have stayed at this mountain long enough. It is time to break camp and move on. You have stayed at this mountain long enough. It's time to break camp and move on. Church, I title this message, You've Been There Long Enough. Now I want you to say it in first person. I've been there long enough. Say it with me. I've been there long enough. I don't know what rut you're in, but let me tell you something. The devil did not want me to preach today, but I'm preaching. And amen. And here's the thing. We have been in some of these ruts that we're in long enough. It's time to move on. It's time to get out, and God is leading the way. You're not going to do it on your own power. God has promised a life that is more abundantly, and it's time to find that and discover it and, and possess that life. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, sermon's over. Let's go home. Let's go apply it. So let's move on. Go on to the hill country, the Amorites, and to all the neighboring regions, the Jordan Valley, the hill country, the western foothills, the Negev, and the coastal plain. Go to the land of the Canaanites, that's the promised land, and to Lebanon, and all the way to the great Euphrates River. Look, I am giving all this land to you. Go in and occupy it, for it is the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to all their descendants. Now, we know the story goes like this, that the spies went out, 10 came back with a negative report, didn't trust and believe that God would deliver them. Joshua and Caleb did. So they did not move forward. And because of that, they wandered the desert 40 years, having to learn to know God and trust him because they were new to God because they were in slavery for 400 years. And now they spent about two months at the bottom of Mount Sinai, 40 days, I believe. Moses was with God and they started acting crazy down at the bottom of the mountain. Okay, not obeying God at all. And they did not obey God and they did not trust him. And so they, they were having to wander around. What should have been 11 years was 40 years east of the Jordan River. But now it was time to take it. And here's why. God said that all those who didn't believe and trust him would die off and only their children would be able to see the promised land. Unfortunately, Moses was also not allowed to enter the promised land because of a response he had at a rock where he was supposed to speak to the rock to have water, and instead he hit the rock, and he also took credit that he and Aaron would provide the water instead of give it to God. So God said, you're not going to be able to enter the promised land, but he did allow him to look at it from a, from a hillside, from an upper area, and he looked out and he saw it. But now he goes and dies, and guess whose turn it is? Joshua one of the ones who believed that there was more for the people of God. They weren't saved from Egypt and slavery to dwell in the desert in tents for the rest of their life. God had more in store. It's the same thing for us today, spiritually and physically. God has more for us at salvation and on. The lesson for us today is, is really simple. God rescued us from slavery and bondage to sin through his son's death and resurrection. God gives us a new life that overcomes the power of sin 
and death through a relationship of faith in Christ. And, and we shouldn't cross the line of salvation, which I'll use the shadow here, saved, and then now I'm just going to barely get by in life. That is not what the Word of God says. That is not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be stuck in ruts one after another. Will ruts come? Will hard times come? Yes. Let me give you my definition of a rut because I forgot to do that in the beginning. I'm going to add this to Jody's, and it's, it's shorter. A rut is an obstacle in your life keeping you from experiencing God and growing into all he has for you and through you. Okay? Now, let me, let me break that down real quick. An obstacle or something that's trying to keep you stuck in your life. Keeping you from what? Just being prosperous and successful for yourself? No. From experiencing God. That's what's more important. And growing into all he has for you, which you got to learn and discover through his will, and then through you, because it's not all about you and me. It's about everyone we can reach, too. It's about, it's about glorifying God and helping other people believe in Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't want you to get out of that rut. He doesn't want you to experience more of God. He doesn't want you to, to possess and, and receive and enjoy all that God has for you, all the spiritual blessings that Ephesians 1 talks about. He doesn't want you to have that because if you do, you're just even more solid and more dangerous to his kingdom, the dark kingdom, okay? And he doesn't want you to dare do anything for other people that's going to tell them about Jesus. He doesn't want that. So he's going to keep you in Egyptian bondage, so to say, quote unquote. He's going to keep you in that bondage state, thinking that you can't get out of your rut. Well, we shouldn't stay there. Let me remind us of what the gospel did for us in Ephesians 2. If you would turn to your Bibles in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And it's going to be on the screen for you as well. By the way, if you want to see all the promises and things you have in, in Christ, read Ephesians 1. It's beautiful. Verse 1 of Ephesians 2. Once you were dead, this is spiritual dead, okay, not physically dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, he's talking to the Christian church. Just make sure to give you some context here. Okay, so he's talking past tense, what you used to be like. Verse 2, you used to live in sin. Like, it was just, it was part of your life, and you just, you didn't care. It was what you did. Just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Okay, so we know now that the devil is behind a lot of things that we gave into before salvation. He wanted you to be stuck in those things. Verse 3 says, all of us used to live that way. And then here's our flesh. Here's our human nature we have to contend with. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. In other words, we were inclined to do things wrong. So, in other words, we, we favored sin versus favoring holiness before Jesus. Okay? It wasn't good. We were in a really bad pit. We weren't even in a rut. We were in a pit with no way out. We were dead. And then you have the beautiful... Oh, let me go on to this part. And then you have the beautiful but God moment. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger or judgment and coming wrath at the end times, just like everyone else. That was our destiny. We were going to be stuck in our sin forever. And then verse four comes in, but God, but God is so rich in mercy we didn't even deserve it, but he, he felt so bad. He felt so much love for us. He wanted us to, to get out of that sin. He, he had so much compassion and love for our situation because it was so bad. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, we were spiritually gone. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Okay, it started with Jesus, not us. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us 
from the dead. That's even worse than a rut that you go through. Along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Why? So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace. How, how gracious he is and kind toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Now here's when it happened. Remember, they were in Egypt and they were stuck somewhere because they didn't believe. God saved you by his grace when you believed. This took place. You transferred from darkness to light. You transferred from spiritual, spiritually dead to alive in Christ. You transferred there in God's eyes. That is a spiritual fact that took place in your life. When you believed in Jesus Christ, you have, been, you have been awoken and now you're alive to the things of God and now the spirit of God in you helps you crucify and not care so much about the, th the sin and the things of this world. That's what took place for you at salvation. It may take a little reading scripture to know that or someone to preach it like I am right now, but that took place from the moment you gave your life to Christ. And then he doesn't stop. Verse 10 for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Not only were you spiritually dead, but now all of a sudden you're useful in the kingdom of God. All of a sudden you have a purpose and a mission and you, you bring value to the kingdom of God. He has plans to use you, and not in a bad way, because you're useful as an instrument to do good things for the kingdom of God. That sounds like me, like a greater life than just barely getting by life. Now, am I preaching to anyone? Are you with me? Help me out here. <clears throat> John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes <clears throat> only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is in the context of the good shepherd. And Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. And he says, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Uh, real quick, just so you know, the church has misinterpreted this scripture quite a bit. So let me go ahead and clarify something. Um, the thief here isn't actually referring to the devil. It's actually referring to the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were contending with Christ over and over again. And Jesus was saying... Believe in me and follow me because I will give you life and life more abundantly. They have come. They're hired hands. They're only doing this because they're hired. They're only doing this to make them look good. They're actually going to steal, kill, and destroy your life if you follow them because their way is death because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. He was saying, look out for the false shepherds, in other words. Because they were, they were shepherds in their own right, in their own eyes, in their own community. They were looked at as shepherds and leaders of religion. And so they were going to lead people down the wrong way. And Jesus was saying, they're going to sneak in the pen and they're going to, they're going to try to steal you. They're going to try to steal you with obeying the law again instead of believing in Christ and, and grace. And that's where he's referring to, obviously, more future because that hasn't been taught yet until the, after the cross. But let me tell you this, though. The devil does influence the Pharisees, doesn't he? And behind, we just read it in Ephesians 1, or Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. He is behind all those things. So is it accurate that we could say the thief is behind, or the thief could be the influence of Satan? Absolutely. But I'm making sure you understand this for a moment. Let me make sure you understand this for a moment. The reason why I'm correcting that is because the devil will use people in your life to take you into a rut. And you're blaming the devil, but meanwhile, there's someone else in your life doing it too. He will use false teachers in the end days. The devil will. He already is. So I'm going to go ahead and expose that lie and that false teaching a little bit. Okay? When you read this context, Satan's never mentioned in this context. Because he's talking about the Pharisees, which are human leaders so look out for human leaders who are going to draw you away because their ambition is only to still kill and destroy your life. How would they do that? They would draw you away from Christ, which is going to still kill and destroy your life. Because he says, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. He's talking about himself. He's not talking about money. 
This has been used for prosperity teaching too. He's talking about himself. And by the way, if you have a lot of Jesus, I bet you can do a lot of good things with your life, which is also to be prosperous. But the difference is, the difference is, if you do it in the name of Jesus Christ, that is true success versus doing it in your own power and self and success and prosperity. He doesn't get the glory because you just did it because you, that, you know, Jesus was your way of getting rich. He, he was a means to an end. That's, that's wrong. So that's where this false teaching is coming in. Okay. But he, the, the good news is, is that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Why are we settling for less? Let me, let me give you a takeaway. We don't have to settle for our spiritual ruts. God saved us for revival. God saves you for revival. I, I will not accept that after salvation, we're supposed to just barely get, up, get by in life. That is not the Jesus that I follow. That is not the Jesus that I see in Scripture. He was full of joy, full of peace, full of kindness, never-ending love, reaching people. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 10 through 11, and Ephesians 1, 19 through 20, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. So I'm not settling for a rut in my life. I'm not settling for mediocre Christianity where I just go through the motions and go to church every week, and that's all God has for me. That's baloney. God has more than just a Sunday. I love Sunday services. I'm here right now, and so are you. Amen. Amen. But if this is it, then we've, we've shrunk God down to a little God, and he's a capital G-O-D. There's so much more to God than just a little service. God's love, life, and power, unending. He's here to give us life and give us victory and purpose here on earth. One of the greatest things that I discovered in my life was what I'm supposed to do after salvation. Because my life is a living billboard of the grace of God, and I want everyone to experience revival life. And I realized something. Some of us may not realize that we're in a rut because we never experienced revival. But the thing is, is the more and more I get close to God, the more and more I read his word, I'm having revival way before I come to church on Sunday morning. Way before I come to church. In fact, if we're waiting for church to give us a revival, then we've made a mistake. But I will say, God will use it. He will use today. And he's already doing it. In the last service and right now as I preach and declare the word of God. So sometimes if you haven't been with God once, you better get here on Sunday. But I'm telling you, he's got more for you on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and on. So if we've been saved from that, why do we keep going back to our old life? Here's another takeaway for you. Put down the grave clothes and walk in the grace clothes. Put down that old life. It's the devil that wants you to just go right back into the grave, right back into your old habits, right back into your old patterns. And meanwhile, Jesus is like, I saved you to get away from that. And I have empowered you to get away from it. I have given you a new heart and new mind, new desires to do what pleases God. Have you ever tried to wear clothes that just is not your style? It's embarrassing, isn't it? It's, em- man, some people try to look really cool. I'm like, just, just go ahead and uh, just take on the dad bod, take on the dad shirts. Just tr- quit trying to look like 20 years old, you know. God help me if I ever do that. And then you ever seen people, you know, get saved and then they try to go back to their old life and you're like, man, that looks awkward. You know that's not you. You've been revived for revival. Why are you going back in your old grave clothes? Why are you living like your old life? That doesn't even look right. You know it's awkward now to do what you used to do. But, you know, those are obvious things like sin, okay? It's obvious, guys, in in church, men and women, children, youth, it's obvious that we're not supposed to continue in sin, okay? And God, God his blood, his blood, it, it saves you and cleanses you from that, that sin, but it also cleanses you and gives you power to not keep sinning. That's how powerful his blood is. It's eternal. So you can do it if you want to and you believe it. 
All right, now those are very obvious, but what about the subtle sins that we're settling for? What about the subtle, the subtle grave things that we're, that we're settling for, like, like living in fear? Why don't we settle for that? Living in anxiety, living in depression, living in hopelessness, living in, in a lack of self-control. Why do we uh, settle for those kind of ruts? If he saved us from spiritual death and, and e- eternal damnation, why don't we have power over those things too? Well, I want to encourage you to consider the fact that the devil wants you to stay in those ruts and God has saved you from them already. You just have to consider yourself free. You have to consider yourself dead to sin, dead to those uh, infirmities, unresponsive in other words. I'm not even going to respond to that because that's not me anymore. That is not true. That is not for me. And then I've seen this too, real quick uh, commercial. Some people get transformed, set free. Because it's a battle. Jody's right. It takes a journey sometimes, and sometimes it's instant. But listen, I know someone who's been dealing with something for four years. Anxiety. Four weeks ago, set free. But her heart and her faith and her mind is trying to catch up. I've seen it before. Wait, I'm free? Yeah, you're free. Wait. You're right. For the past four weeks, I haven't had any anxiety. Yep. You haven't. Because you've been healed. Because people believe that you would be healed. People put a hand on you and prayed for you for healing, and you've been healed. But sometimes our faith has to grow. That's what Jody was trying to say. Sometimes we have to mature and grow and actually believe it actually happens. And that we actually have the power of the living spirit in us, the Holy Spirit in us. It's a work in progress. I know someone like that right now healed from that physical sickness and anxiety and they're just catching up and they just they just recognize it this past week you know I think you're right I'm different I'm different you see the devil wants you to stay in that old mindset the old grave clothes that you're not healed maybe we need to answer a question real quick then moving forward how did I even get here so quite I mean this could be a sermon in itself how did I get here how did I get in this rut and I'm, I'm being general on purpose um, so that you can apply your own rut to this message. Okay? Um, how did I get here? How did I get into a rut? I'm, I got some D words for you because that's what pastors are supposed to do. So you can remember, you can remember them. Number one, uh, doing the same thing over and over again, believe it or not, can actually get you in a rut. And the reason why, and I have a slide for you for these so you can see these and write them down. The reason why is it, routines are great. I, I like my routines, but when they become rote and heartless, now I'm just doing it just to do it. And I'm referring to God. When we, when we hang out with God, if we just keep doing it because you're supposed to do it, and 15 minutes later of reading the word and praying or more, uh, you don't even remember what you read, just go ahead and stop doing that. And God rather talk to you and, and you listen to him and worship him or do something different and then come back to the word so he can actually speak to you. Because that, that's doing the same thing over and over again uh, doesn't necessarily mean spiritual growth unless your heart is in it. Because God wants your heart. He wants your attention. So you know what actually hurts that routine is the next one, distractions. Distractions of life, preoccupation with other things. Distraction with things in your mind and your heart. Um, Distracted by the things of this world. They get your mind. The devil loves distracting you from being with God. And then another another word is disobedience. We get into ruts because, you know, not only have we been distracted from following God and his plan and experiencing more of God and all he has for us and through us, but now we're just disobeying God. He said to quit doing that, and we keep doing it. So guess where we are? right back in the rut. And then he says to do some things and we don't do them and we're still in the rut. We can't blame everything on the devil. Just so you know, God gave us a game plan in his word. We, we have to follow it. That's why the devil wasn't for, at fault for the Israelites. They were, they were punished for it. And then 
disconnection, this is the most scariest one, I feel like, because it's leading up to all this. Disobedience can cause you to disconnect because you're ashamed for what you've done, so you don't even want to be in the presence of God. So now you disconnect yourself and distance yourself from a holy God, thinking that his holiness can't handle your mess, but he can. And so you don't go to him in your sin and your regrets and and all the other things. And now you run away from him. And now Satan's clapping going, yes, go ahead. Stay away from God. Don't get into your word. Don't get into your prayer closet. Don't start worshiping him. Stay quiet. Don't trust him. Don't do any of that. That's exactly what he wants for you. And meanwhile, God came to an ugly, messy, sinful world from heaven and walked among us. I think he can handle our mess. So we just need to humble ourselves and let him minister to us in that dark time. Well, then what happens if we don't deal with the disconnection? Now we begin to doubt everything we ever learned. This is where deconstruction of Christianity is coming in right now. You continue to distance yourself from God. Now you begin to question every belief that you ever were raised in or the word of God says. And you distance yourself more and more. And now you begin to doubt everything God says. And you don't believe that he will do what he said he would do. Some of us may even not even believe that he set us free yet. When he actually has or will if we let him. If we walk in the victory we already have through the cross and the grave. So this is how the devil works. And I forgot to add this one. I, I, well, technically I really got it this morning or last night. I can't remember, but the last D word is deception. And this is where the devil comes in. He will deceive you. Deception. He will lie and he will deceive you and you will get stuck in this rut. And that's why we can't disconnect ourselves from the word of God or disobey or be distracted or do the same thing over and over again because we get ourselves in some kind of rut. God has not saved you for that kind of life. So I want to confront one before we close. One, this is the one that I know the devil doesn't want me to say. <clears throat> it's the I can't change rut. And I'm praying that you receive this today. This is the rut that makes you believe you are doomed to remain stuck in whatever rut you're in forever. This is not true, and this is not from God. This is a rut that has infiltrated your mind, which makes it very dangerous because it would determine what you believe. And yet it's the opposite of what Scripture teaches. The rut, this rut is dangerous because if you believe that lie then how will you overcome other spiritual ruts in your life? If I can't change, then I'm doomed in every rut that I have. Think about that. If, if <clears throat> you begin to believe that you'll never get out of the mess you're in, that you can never change your heart, your attitude, all those things, if you live with that belief that this is the way it's always gonna be, you're always, no other ruts then are gonna be resolved. But here's the thing. The reality is you can't change without God. And so it's true. I can't change these circumstances, but God can. And that's why the devil wants you to distance yourself from God, to disconnect, to disobey, to be deceived, that this is the way it's always going to be for you. This is a lie from Satan because the the scriptures are the opposite of what this says. The scriptures show that anyone can be transformed and changed by Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's the power to save. And some of us are stuck and going, this is the way it's always going to be. I have no choice. This is my life. I guess this is the way it's going to be. It's not true. This is spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. Do not be seduced by this. Do not be seduced with this lie that you can't grow in Christ, that you can't overcome some habit or pattern of sin, that you can't be set free from your old past, that you can't be, that you can't even grow and become all that God has called you to be. Do not listen to the devil there. It's not true. And don't listen to yourself if you've believed him. 
I've heard it said, it's okay to not be okay. It's true. It's okay to admit you're not okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. That doesn't glorify God. He's the, he's the resurrection and life. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and life. He's brought people physically from the dead alive. He himself came to life. If he can do that, he can overcome any obstacle, any struggle that you're going through. Do not believe the lie. In fact, let me rebuke one right now. Let's, let's close our eyes and let's assess our own life and assess if you're not okay. You know, assess if there is a rut that you've been stuck in and you've kind of gotten settled in it and you've believed that this is just the way life is always going to be. And now I'm disrupting that lie today. I'm disrupting that. But it's not me. God wants to speak this to your heart and mind today because it's truth. So I want to correct a lie. I want to correct that lie real quick. And I say this in Jesus' name. I rebuke the lie. I correct the lie that has become your belief in rut that you can't change. That is not from God. That is from the devil. God made us for more. God made us for revival life, not barely getting by life. Lord, we need you today. Hey, if this is, any of this is speaking to you, any of this is relating to you, we're opening the altars right now. We're going to sing together too. I want you to come on down. And, and, and just and come down for yourself because right now you can't change anyone. You can't, you can't make people get out of their ruts. You've, you've believed a lie and maybe, maybe you do need to intercede for someone. Come on down. Let's intercede for someone who needs to be set free from this lie. It happened to me. It's happened to me many times. But one in particular is I believe that I could never get healthy again. Three years ago, I fell for the lie and the bondage that I'm gonna be unhealthy, I'm gonna be sick physically. I was, I was way overweight than I should be. I didn't care anymore. I just said, I guess this is the way it's gonna be until God brought a plan in my life that helped me. And I almost didn't start right before, the night before I almost didn't start it because I didn't believe I could do it. And then I realized I can do it if I do it with God. Amen. And God began to help me through this plan and teach me and help me be, live a healthier life. And the reason why it was pivotal is because I didn't realize this yet, but the church would hire me as the lead pastor here a few months later. But see, the devil wanted me to be so trapped in my unhealthy living that I would be unsuccessful and ineffective for the kingdom of God. He doesn't want that for you. Now, translate that to any rut you've been in. Don't, that may not be your rut, but that was mine. I mean, I was 320 pounds. I, had, I lost 70 pounds because I, I applied what God said to do. I began to look to God to get me out of that rut. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't know if you're stuck in a bondage of sin or despair, but we want to pray over you right now. So come on up. Let's pray for you. I know this looks weird because like you're like, you're admitting this in front of everyone. I get it. But I'm, I just admitted something that's really personal in front of all of you. It's okay. It's okay. And prayer team, why don't you come on up now and just start praying over them. Begin to pray over them. Lord, God, deliver today. Deliver today. God, we do not accept that lie today. In this whole room, across the room and online, Lord, we don't accept the lie that we can't change. Your gospel is transformation and change. With your help, by your power, not our own, God, you change us. So right now, in Jesus' name, begin to set free. Right now, deliver them, Lord, from this rut, this lie, this stronghold in their mind that they can't escape that past. They can't escape what they've done and the shame that they have. Lord, I pray right now you'd wash away the shame in Jesus' name. Lord, wash it, wash it away by the blood of Christ who makes us white as snow, Lord God 
that stronghold, Lord, that has held us captive and in bondage, Lord, break it right now in Jesus' name. We receive freedom. We look back at the cross and the grave and see freedom over sin and death, freedom over addictions, freedom over sin, freedom over despair and hopelessness. We receive freedom today, Lord God, and teach us to walk out in freedom today, Lord. Teach us to trust you, Lord. Teach us to get close to you, God. Teach us to believe you for your word and at your word, Lord. And what your word says today, we believe it. We are, our old life is gone. Our new life has come. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. We believe that today. Everyone in this room from the front to the back, Lord, we are trusting, Lord, that from this day forward, we will not just walk right back in our default mode in our old grave clothes, Lord. We've learned how to do it really well, but we're done with that. And now we want to learn how to do it your way, God. And we do intercede for those who are not here today, God. We pray that you would get a hold of their hearts today. Get a hold of their hearts, Lord, who are stuck in a pit of despair, who are stuck and lost, Lord God. Yank them out of the rut, Lord. We know by your grace and your spirit, you can go where they are today and you can set them free. You can wake them up to the freedom they have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that the same power that rose Christ from the dead dwells and lives and is active in our lives. And so we commit ourselves to walk by the spirit and not the flesh, to follow the spirit's leading and not our own way. Lord, move by your power today. Lord, we believe this will take place, that the spiritual transactions will happen, God, and we will see physical evidence of changed lives. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me, church? Praise the Lord. Now, we're going to do something. Don't get, don't get scared. Don't worry. You can stay where you are. I heard a pastor say Sunday morning is, is like the morning where Christians lie the most. And, I, and, and I, I, I kept reading and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 I get what he's saying. We'll, we'll worship songs, but we don't really, like we'll say them and we'll sing them. But man, we go and live differently. And it convicted me when I read it. And we sang anything is possible. And now that you've heard this sermon, and just so you know, right now, just the devil doesn't want you to be free. You don't believe you can. You don't believe you can change. It's a lie. So I'm fighting back right now just in case it's already building up in you. If you go with Jesus and follow him and do what he says, you can be free. It could be a journey. Amen. Hey. It could be a journey of 40 years. I pray it's not. They found their freedom. They got to the promised land. Just so you know, good news is we win. It, we have victory. Spiritually, we already have the victory if we believe in Christ. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, who's your Lord and Savior, call out to him today and be saved. Save you from your sins. Save you from that bondage. And receive eternal life. But listen, we're going to sing a song, Anything is Possible. Now, these lyrics are going to stand out a lot different, I, I promise you. And if you need to dance, if you need to get excited for God, I even told the men last service, Matt, you, you may not want to dance in front of everyone. I get it. So maybe at home, go to your private place, you know, in your man cave and begin to dance off those grave clothes and dance in the grace clothes that's already on you. All right, ladies, you can dance too. Maybe you're nervous, right? But sometimes you gotta praise him now before you see the victory. Okay? You gotta believe you already have it too. Okay? So let's let's sing this song with all of our heart. I'm telling you, it's different when you sing it after a message like this. We thank you for revival, Lord. We thank you for the freedom today in this place, Lord. We thank you, God. We praise you for what you've already done, what you've done today, and what you're going to do, Lord. Lord, we walk out with greater faith today. The Lord, we are not in bondage anymore. That we're not identified by our past or anything we've done or anything that's happened to us. We are free. Our identity is in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. God, I thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would go 
and that we would shake off the old grave clothes and now live in the grace clothes that is greater than anything else, Lord. It's Jesus Christ. So go with us, Lord. Be with us. And church, go in peace. Enjoy your Sunday, Lord. Enjoy your Sunday, and may the Lord be praised in your life and through your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. God bless you.